Good morning. My name is Corrado Versi. I teach legal philosophy at the University of Bologna. Thank you very much for listening and my talk. Today I will talk about institutional power. And I will argue that the common conception of institutional power in social ontology should be extended. So I will present this common shared conception. According to this conception, which I label the R model of institutional ontology, institutional entities, facts, properties, depend for their existence on rules, which can be called constitutive. And these rules are in their own turn based on social facts that can vary depending on the conception that we assume. I have labeled these facts anchoring facts coherently with Brian Epstein's view so depending on the conception that you assume these anchoring facts can be collective acceptance, equilibrium game theory, social practices, social conventions. And I would say that much of the discussion in social ontology has to do with this problem, that of the nature of anchoring facts. But apart from this problem, the R model is quite shared. Now, I believe that this model is quite monodimensional and that it obscures important problem with which social ontology should, should deal. The first problem has to do with the background of anchoring facts. So we assume that indeed there are anchoring facts that, for example, collective acceptance can create institutions. But how is it so? And why is that so? Why does collective acceptance frame the institution in that way and not in another? What is the more general conceptual, teleological, axiological background within which collective acceptance creates an institution? I think this is an important problem. And this is a problem that is often overlooked in contemporary social ontology. And this is a problem about the presuppositions of collective acceptance. On the other hand, apart from the problem of the presuppositions, we have a problem of what happens ex post, of the effects of institutional entities. So we have a theory about what uh, exists as a social entity, its structures, um, the way it is framed, but we do not focus very much on the actual effects of those entities. So how do people behave in light of that? What are the effects of these entities on the social context? What I label the social impact of institutions. Now, this monodimensionality of institutional ontology is, in my view, quite general. And uh, when it comes to applying the R model, this emerges quite well, depending on the notion that we focus on. Today, we will focus on power. So the R model of institutional power is, in my view, monodimensional. Now, let me show you why and what are the consequences of this monodimensionality? Here, too, we have the problem of presuppositions. Power, according to the R model, is nothing else than institutional power. So rule-constituted normative power. But what are the presuppositions of acceptance of this kind of power? These presuppositions in a sense, raise the problem of a regress. So we have acceptance that creates institutional power, according to some conceptions, but then what gives acceptance the power to create institutional power? 
Why acceptance? Collective acceptance, uh, not God, for example, or not nature, if we assume a natural law view. So what is the ultimate root of power and the ultimate background of our conception of power in a given community? This is the same problem as before, but in this case applied to the problem of power. And as in the previous case, we also have the problem of the social effects of power. There are kinds of power that either are social powers that are not normative capacities constituted by rules, but rather proceed by way of persuasion, suggestion, deterrence. So these are not normative, but causal kinds of power. Shouldn't, should these be eliminated from social ontology? Aren't these relevant for social ontology? Of course they are. So I think that the uh, model should be extended here. In order to do so in previous writings, I have um, proposed a three-dimensional model for institutional ontology. According to this model, Apart from the institutional level, which basically encompasses constitutive rules and deontic normative powers, we also have a meta-institutional level in which the features of an institution that depend on its teleological and axiological background are included, and a para-institutional level in which instead the features of an institution that depend on its being practiced are included. And when it comes to power, we can have a three-dimensional model for power. So apart from institutional power, which is a normative capacity constituted by rules, so basically a deontic power in some sense, we can have a meta-institutional power, which is a capacity that is in a sense presupposed by the institution, given the institution broader background, and a para-institutional power, which is a causal capacity to influence the behavior of people by foreseeing their behavior in the light of the institution's rules. So let me give an example here, taking the classic example of chess. If in chess, a player has the power to take pieces in, by way of a valid move, this is an institutional power, a chess player has the power, for example, in normal situation, to quit the game without giving too much reasons to do so, because this is a game. And he is a chess player and hence a player. So this kind of power, or also the power to propose house rules to his opponent and to agree on a house rule, this kind of power does not depend on chess in particular, but rather on the way game playing and competitive game playing in no formalized settings is framed. On the other hand, if you are a good player of chess, and this is a case of para-institutional power, then you have the power to influence other players' behavior depending on the context or to influence their moves or to make them avoid you in tournaments. This depends on the way you practice the institution and the way you strategize around it. Now, what does this three-dimensionality explain apart from these very basic phenomena? I think that this three-dimensionality explains important points about relevant domains in, in the social realm, given that I am a legal theorist and will focus on law. So a classic example of institutional power in law is lawmaking. So the power of the parliament to enact valid statutes. Now, are there meta-institutional powers in law? I think that in light of the concept of meta-institutional power, a story can be conjectured about the explanation of constituent power. As you may know, 
formalistic legal positivism during the 19th and 20th century faced the problem of the regress of legal validity. The problem was, if all power depends on a legally valid norm, once does the power to enact the constitution come? Indeed, if I have a norm and the norm is created through an act and the act is authorized by way of another norm, then in the end you will arrive at the constitution authorizing the act of parliaments to enact uh, valid statutes. And then you have the act of the constituent assembly. Now the problem is, which norm of the system can authorize the act of the constituent assembly to enact the constitution? Now, as you may know, there are in legal theory two main uh, solutions to this problem. One which can be labeled a normative solution, tracing back to Hans Kelsen or HLA art. The idea here is that you indeed have a norm, but that norm is not a formally valid norm. Kelsen said it is presupposed, Hart said it is a social rule. On the other hand, you can have a reductionist solution, which I um, trace here to Austin on the one hand, John Austin, and to Carl Schmitt on the other hand, according to which the constituent power is simply a causal power. So you have the causal power to, in a sense, enforce the constitution and create it concretely. Now, my idea is that this important distinction and this traditional power in legal theory can be eliminated if we conceive it in terms of meta-institutional power. And I conjecture that the distinction between a normativist and a reductionist solution can be simply a distinction about two ways of interpreting meta-institutional power in law, the meta-institutional power of something to enact a valid legal system and the rules of a valid legal system according to a previous conception of law in general, what counts as law, what counts as legality in general. Then, what about para-institutional power? It seems to me that para-institutional power can illuminate several instances of power that are not, strictly speaking, the power to enact norms and are not the power exercised in terms of norms like do this and people do this. So, for example, the power of... Um, uh, professors, policemen, or people having a status to influence others' behavior simply by virtue of their status. Or if we indeed have the power to regulate, we can regulate not simply by stating do this, but in a nudge-like way, by framing the institutional facts in a way that people acting in light of the way these institutional facts are framed will behave the way we want them to behave. So tax deductions, receipt lotteries, or, or also the idea uh, that the zebra crossings can be drawn to simulate three-dimensionality to improve the prudence of car drivers. So we do not, strictly speaking, regulate by saying, do that. But we frame the institution and people will react in a given way. And the, the, the mechanism through which they will do so can, be, can vary, can be prudential reasoning, a form of suggestion, it can be mixed. So you can have direct or indirect, transparent or, in, or opaque kinds of power institutional power. Now, it seems to me that these two notions are important, but I also think that it is important to know that these two notions, meta-institutional and para-institutional power, are quite vague. And I think that this is why probably um, positive positivism, formalistic legal positivism in particular, and in general jurists, 
do focus on institutional power because institutional power is, uh, is quite clear, it is rule defined. Meta institutional power, on the other hand, depends on tacit rules, customs, presuppositions. So, how do we really uh, explain, identify the content of these presuppositions? Of course, this can vary very much uh, depending on the conception, as we saw with the normativistic reading and reductionistic reading of constituent power. On the other hand, parainstitutional power is vague in another way. So it seems to me that it is vague because it is difficult to um, distinguish clearly between the intended effects of an institution, a status of the way an institution is framed and the side effects. So in order to exemplify this, I will give you uh, yes, a peculiar and strange example to show you that this distinction is not always clear. So let's focus on uh, this place. This place is Albero Bello in Puglia, Italy. Albero Bello is uh, a wonderful place and you will find here these strange kinds of buildings called Trulli. So the, the peculiar part of Trulli is that uh, they were built in a sense, in a dry way. So uh, bricks were put one on the other without using any kind of substance to fix them. Mm -hmm. And these truly are really, mm, you can find them everywhere in Puglia, but Albert Bello was basically a city builder that way. Now, the striking part is that it seems that the reason why truly were so um, common in Puglia is that they were a way to um, avoid an edict of the uh, Kingdom of Naples that subjected every new settlement to a tribute. Now, the fact is that truly could be destroyed very easily. So the counts of Conversano, d'Acquaviva, d'Aragona imposed on the residents that they build their dwellings dry. Now, this indeed became the typical way of uh, build houses. And this is in a sense, uh, a para-institution facts, given the way tributes were framed in the kingdom of Naples. But can we really say that this is a kind of para-institutional power? Is Albero Bello an intended effect of that tribute? Of course, it was not. So indeed, it is very difficult to, uh, this is an easy case, of course, but in some cases, it, it is difficult to, um, put a distinction between intended and non-intended side effects. And very often, um, unintended side effects can be uh, reformulated as intended side effects of a given institution, for example, by imagining any kind of conspiracy theory, okay? So uh, I think this is an important point. Now, um, in the end, I, I will try to um, answer this problem. What does this add to the existing literature? Now, uh, I found three main um, works uh, dealing with this problem. Asa Anderson in Power and Social Ontology, John Searle on Background Power, and Joshua Rass on Weber and Social Ontology. So Anderson, uh, talks about, in his wonderful book, Power and Social Ontology, talks about telic power and causal power, which can be put in analogy with meta-institutional and para-institutional power, uh, respectively. But I think that my approach is narrower, narrower than hers, because uh, she speaks about these um, kinds of power in general, and my idea is that instead these telic and causal powers are inherently connected with an institution. Uh, 
Now, I think that this idea in general is uh, also what puts a difference uh, the, be, between um, Searle's discussion of background power and my discussion of meta-institutional power. Searle talks about um, norms embedded in the background in general. I argue that for every institution, there is a specific kind of background power. Finally, Joshua Ras, in his wonderful paper of Weber on so and social ontology, argues that social ontology does not deal with kinds of power based on suggestion or persuasion, uh, kinds of legitimation um, that are alternative to the rule-based legitimation. Um, and, and he traces back to Weber, rightly so. Uh, uh, now, I think that um, social ontology indeed should deal with these kinds of um, legitimation, these kinds of power, but I think that um, um, para-institutional powers based on suggestion or persuasion um, are inherent to any institution. So these are not alternatives to the rule-based uh, power, but they are inherently connected to it. Uh, in a sense, when you have a rule-based power, you have a status, and given the status, you have also, you can have also kinds of power given based on suggestion and persuasion. Thank you very much for your atten attention. I hope you liked the presentation. Thank you.